Hello, this is Hunter McDermott with another episode of Guitar Blog. We're up to uh, episode 20. It is Wednesday, December 11th, 2019, 4.50pm. Uh, let's see, it's been a pretty eventful week. Um, I'll start with uh, this past Saturday, I went up to Taos, New Mexico, and got to see Bill Frizzell and Julian Lage as a duo, which is amazing because those are two guitar players that I genuinely love and uh, to get to see them playing uh, together is like a dream, you know. <laughs> the likelihood that you'll get to see two of your heroes on stage playing together at the same time in sort of near your town when you live in a state where people never come almost um, compared to like places like Denver and whatever. So. I was actually going to go see him up in uh, Colorado Springs, and then they eventually announced a show a lot closer to me. So I gave my ticket to a friend, and he got to see him, and I got to see him, and so that was pretty pretty good. Um, what I loved so much about uh, the show, so I kind of picture it like, sort of like a, I don't know, I was trying to come up with like a drawing. <laughs> it's sort of like, sort of like this. Like you got the, both guys, and you got Bill... Uh, who is always fascinating to me because he is such a brilliant player and he he plays you know sort of sparingly but you know he's sort of Miles Davis-y in that way where he can plays if he wants to but he almost never does and Jillian's kind of the same way uh, he's a little flashier but but Bill is, can play beautiful things whenever he wants and but when he when you watch him play it's almost like he can't he seems like he can't keep up right he's got this sort of concerned look on his face like I don't know what's going to happen. And then he always pulls off, you know, something amazing. And then you get these little toothy grins every now and again. So I feel like Bill was watching Julian's hands uh, and certainly listening too. But then you had uh, Julian watching Bill's face, like, because that's just what Julian does. He's always like looking the other player in the eye. He does that with Chris Eldridge and, um, and with his trio, uh, Jorge and Eric and you know, Scott Colley and whoever he's playing with that night, but he's, he's watching his bandmates, uh, in their eyes more than watching what they're doing. Cause I guess he's just got that, those good ears, but he's always w looking at picking up on little signals. So I just thought that was interesting. The kind of the slightly different way that they, that they proceed. Julian never looks like he's out of his element, right? He's always, you know, got this big grin on his face. Like he's just anticipating everything and he knows how to do it. And of course, Bill does, you know, he can play as well, if not better, than Julian in some respects. You know, they're different. But uh, just watching Bill just kind of seems sort of like, oh, I don't know what's going on. And then, like, hits on something that's really great. And then he kind of grins. And then he goes back into serious focus mode. And I just, it was so entertaining to watch. It's the first time I've gotten to see Bill uh, at all. So uh, that was a real treat. So it was kind of like these two streams of notes. They would play tunes. They did... Um, Seven Come Eleven, they did All the Things You Are. They did one of Julian's tunes called Encore for the Encore. And they did some other ones that I think I recognize, but I don't know the name of them. But so they're kind of like, you know, and, and, and if you watch Bill too, he doesn't really comp in that kind of traditional way. There was a really great video of a fretboard journal uh, on YouTube with Bill Frizzell and uh, John Pizzarelli. And, it, you know, they never play together. They've met, but they've never played together. And then they play on this on this podcast kind of video thing. And uh, when it comes time for Bill to solo, uh, John is just, you know, laying down this nice bass line and some comping chords. And he's, you know, doing what you would expect. But then when it flips, Bill doesn't do that. He doesn't ever just comp or ba lay a bass line down for John. He's trying to kind of get in to the spaces in between what John is doing and create his own little melody counterpoint kind of thing. So if you watch that video and you hear those moments where Bill is, is supposed to be in the support role for John, uh, but he's kind of soloing himself, that's kind of what the whole night was with Bill and Julian. So they're kind of just noodling and then they hit on something and they kind of like, they synchronize for a few seconds or you know half a minute or whatever. And then they, they go off on a tangent again. So it's just really cool, like uh, tension, that's constantly uh, fluctuating, ebbing and flowing as they play. Uh, and, it's, and it's just 
proof that both these guys are listening intently to what the other is doing and when they catch when they hit on something that they think will harmonize well or maybe sometimes they just play in unison with or whatever um then they then they do that but otherwise they're kind of just like i'm doing my own thing but i'm paying attention to how it blends with what you're doing and i'm not trying to step on your toes i'm trying to like kind of fill in those gaps um i got to see julian last year i guess in in denver and he did like a master class thing so like for i think a half an hour before the actual concert he invited if you paid a little extra you got to come in early and and have a chat with him he would share some things and then take took questions and gave advice which was really cool um and i remember one of the things he talked about was playing along to records he's like people always told me play along to records but i never really understood what that meant uh and then he said he kind of figured it out and so he tried a couple examples i know he put on um a miles davis tune and tried that and then there was another tune i don't remember which other one he played with but it was something that was kind of not strictly a, a jazz standard more modern or like R&B or something like that. But anyway, he put on the recording and then he would play along with it, not playing what they're playing, just kind of trying to fill up the spaces in between whatever the, the music is providing and figure out how you can contribute to the overall sound without drowning it or, you know, clashing with it in some sort of uh, undesirable way. And and again, that's kind of how they how they were when they were playing together just constantly listening and trying to fill in those little gaps. And it's, uh, I can see how it's a really good thing to practice because uh, I don't spend a lot of time listening. Usually when I'm at a jam and I'm playing with other people, I'm really concerned about not messing up the comping or if I'm soloing, not messing up the chord changes underneath what I'm doing. Uh, and I'm rarely doing what you should be doing, which is listening to other players, playing off of them, uh, that kind of thing. So that's a good lesson to, to learn. Um, they only did four shows and I was, you know, very fortunate that they were right where I am, uh, considering they could be anywhere. Uh, Bill actually grew up in Denver, so I guess it's not terribly a stretch that he would be kind of in that area, but, uh, he doesn't live there anymore. So whatever, kind of a crapshoot, but got lucky, very pleased that I got to do that. Uh, if you ever get a chance to see either of them do, if you get a chance to see them together, then definitely do. Um, anyway. So that's that. That was cool. That was fantastic this weekend. Um, so something else kind of related to that, um, like I guess understanding how to play or different players and how they work together. A um, couple things. So last year I read this book called Playing Changes by Nate Chinen. Uh, and it's called uh, Jazz for the New Century. And it's a really great book because he... Uh, I guess he works, let's see, what publication does he work for? Nate works for some publication, and he uh, writes the jazz column or, you know, jazz reviews or whatever. He's done stuff for NPR, New York Times, different radio stations, Jazz Night in America, things like that. So the guy knows what he's talking about. And the overall kind of thesis of the book, I guess I would say, is how jazz as a style of music seems sort of divided where you've got and and i don't know if this is fair but at least in the book he kind of paints like winton marsalis as kind of the bearer of the old ways like he sort of codified what he believes jazz is he runs jazz at lincoln center big outreach program education concerts stuff like that so he's he's at the you know in a position where he can kind of dictate what jazz is for a lot of people i mean it's certainly uh he's done some unconventional things in his recordings uh but i guess he holds true to he believes that jazz is something something specific that has this uh you know fits in this specific time frame and kind of fits these different um parameters i guess and so the book is kind of illustrating how Winton thinks and how what he's done to sort of preserve jazz as we know it, or as we've known it, and then also contrasting it with players who buck that trend. So he talks about Kamasi Washington and Brad Meldau and um, Esperanza Spaulding, and I those are the three big ones I remember, but he might talk about some others. He certainly drops a lot of names in there at, at one point or another. 
Um, but kind of just showing that like that's what makes jazz so interesting is the fact that you can't really codify it. Uh, but I certainly feel that similar confusion where I want to, as somebody who comes from songwriting and feeling like when I was doing that, I was being a creative person. I was absorbing a lot of stuff that I liked and then spitting it out in some new way that, you know, helped me, uh, one, have fun and two, communicate, you know, articulate things that I didn't even really know I was thinking about. Uh, and that's, you know, kind of what that's, that would be my definition of art, really some sort of catharsis or at least a creative outlet to kind of learn more about yourself really. Um, by like observing what you did. Oh, cool. I did this thing. Where'd that come from? And then looking at it or listening to it or understanding it in some way, um, to learn more about yourself, which is what, what I like about being creative anyway. But then understanding that like jazz does have tons of education at this point from like the seventies on, there are so many books and there are schools and there are courses and, uh, all these people kind of trying to tell you what jazz is and how to do it. Um, and, trying to balance the two. Like I want to, listening to somebody like Bill Frizzell or Julian Lodge really are perfect examples of people who are considered jazz musicians, but when you listen to them, they are not doing what Grant Green and Wes Montgomery and Pat Martino and John Schofield are doing. They're doing their own thing. Well, John Schofield really is kind of doing his own thing too, but anyway, they don't fit into that kind of uh, crusty old template, whatever you want to call it. Um, but they're certainly playing improvisational music, and if you call the standard, which like they played all the things you are, um, they can play that, you know, as good as anybody. But distinctly themselves, you know, they play in the way that they play, and you instantly recognize when you're listening to Bill Frizzell or John Schofield or Pat Metheny or whatever. These people have very, um, you know, you can tell from just hearing them because they're they're they've got a unique style about how they play. And that's what you want to cultivate. You want to be able to hang, at least this is my personal goal, I want to be able to hang on a, uh, on a standard, play at a jam, be able to kind of play and learn about and approach these old tunes in a way that is, you know, jazzy, but do it in my own specific way that is uniquely me. Um, and I, you know, that takes a long time to figure out who you are and what your voice is and what you can bring to things. And there's a lot of value in learning what people have done. So again, that's about absorbing as much stuff as you can. And then when it comes time to solo, all that stuff gets mixed and mashed and comes out in some new form, right? Nothing uh, new there, but I have to kind of remind myself of that. Um, I am being creative, even though I'm kind of studying this in an academic way you have to kind of balance the two uh but anyway so that book is kind of i would i read it as kind of like anti-winton right in his kind of school of this is what jazz is and this is what jazz is not um but then i recently listened to an episode of a podcast called mindscape with a guy named sean carroll who is a physicist i believe i don't know how old this episode is but um i guess it's somewhat within the last few years he interviews Wynton Marcellus, and I thought uh, it was very fascinating to have read this book and then listen to this podcast because you're hearing, you know, straight from Wynton how he feels about jazz, um, and it's an especially interesting conversation because he's talking to a physicist, so they get into some interesting sort of scientific and then eventually like philosophical conversations about what is music, and uh, it's a it's an interesting question to have answered by these two different. Uh, experts in their seemingly separate fields, but they find a way to kind of find the common ground, uh, which is fascinating. But just listening to the way Winton describes how he thinks of jazz is very much not academic. Like it's very, uh, very much like soulful, thinking like emotionally and describing things in a very poetic way, uh, and not just so much about well, jazz is this and this and this. It's He's describing it more as like a feeling or a mood or, you know, the interplay of different musicians and stuff. And so I thought he put it in a really articulate way uh, that I would recommend you check that out, Mindscape. Um, 
So anyway, I'm, I'm appreciative that I read this book and then found this podcast. I wasn't really searching for these two sides of this person, but I ended up kind of finding them. Uh, and so the book was really good for exposing me to, you know, for, to Winton in general, because I didn't know a whole lot about him. Uh, and then all these more modern jazz musicians, how they're carrying jazz into the uh, 21st century. And then getting a, a sense from Witten himself, how he feels about the music. Uh, you know, I'm sure he would disagree with the way he is kind of portrayed in this book, but I don't know. It'd be interesting to, to, to see how he feels about it. Uh, but anyway, so I recommend you check out that book and uh, definitely check out the podcast because the podcast is free. Might as well. Um, okay, so I want to talk about one more thing that I've been thinking about. Uh, and then I'm going to do some playing. I did promise to play the blues head that I wrote for the course that I'm going through. Uh, and then I thought I'd finish up by just kind of jamming a little bit on um, the Monk Tune Straight Note Chaser, which I've been also working on. Um, so staying focused. I did a video a while ago, um, not a blog, but just like a regular anyone can play guitar video about how to continue to progress um, without a teacher. And I feel like the more I study on my own, and I certainly used to teach. I te taught professionally for years. I never taught jazz, not really. Um, but uh, thinking about not having a teacher, the thing about not having a teacher, I think, is just a lack of focus and um, accountability, I guess, really are the two, the two things. The things that I struggle with, like um, I, I get so excited about some new thing that I, I just, it's like, before I know it, I've wasted a couple hours on some tangent, and I haven't, I haven't forgotten what I was really trying to work on, you know, most immediately, um, which is just terrible for your ability to get things done. Um, so I kind of want to amend that video, because in that one I talk about this uh, practice journaling type thing that Mike Outram came up with. And admittedly, when I recorded that video, I thought, this is a great idea. But I hadn't really spent much time actually doing that, like following that method. Um, but anyway, in the intervening year or months or whatever, uh, I picked up uh, bullet journaling, which I mentioned in the mindfulness blog video. Um, and so I got this uh, other notebook. I was kind of trying to keep track of my practices in my you know, regular everyday work life notebook, and then decided I would just start a new one for specifically music. Um, and what's great about it is that I set up each month and, you know, personally, not like it matters to everybody, but I've got a little calendar and so I can cross off days that I practice because I just like to see that I am practicing every day or as, you know, more often than not, unless there's some reason I can't practice that day. I want to be able to kind of see that and go like, okay, my trend is, the trend is that I'm, you know, regularly sitting, sitting down and working on stuff. So that's good. Um, and then you set up the month and I put out priorities like, okay, this month I want to get through this chapter of the sight reading book. And I want to finish this phase of this course I'm going through. And I'd like to learn this tune or whatever, you know, I try to keep it uh, month, you know, something that I feel like I can get accomplish that month. Um, and that's all well and good. So that's good. But then it came time to do like a daily log. And this is what's really great about bullet journaling for me. It's effectively a, a to-do list. So it's nothing, you know, revolutionary, but for whatever reason, this is the to-do list that I, that I actually use and stick with and have for, you know, like four months now, which is longer than I've done anything. So I'm, I'm optimistic about my ability to keep, to keep using this method. But when it came time to do the practice log for a guitar, I would kind of, rather than bullet bullet pointing what I needed to do or what I wanted to do and planned to do, I would do it after the fact. I would go, what did I do? So I would sit down and go, oh, well, I didn't really have a lot of time or I didn't make time for today. So I ran through, you know, this tune and I did this exercise and that was it. Um, and then I remembered like, I don't know, I've been doing this for like, again, three, three or four months now uh, with the, just the music one. And only recently did I realize that's not the way you should do it. Do it the way that you do the regular bullet journal, which is think ahead about what you want to accomplish and write those things down. And then when you sit down to practice, you've got this thing ready for you that says these are the things to do. And then you don't spend any amount of time not doing something that 
is valuable to you and is leading you to some goal that you have for yourself. Uh, because you only pick things that, or at least I only want to pick things that are leading me to this this goal. And then if you don't finish all of them, that's fine. Then the next day you look back and you say, okay, I didn't do this one from yesterday or two days ago or whatever, so do that. Um, it's simple. <laughs> it's not complicated. But for whatever reason, that was just totally escaping me. And for several months now, I've been just kind of, I've been very diligently logging what I did but not spending any time thinking ahead of time about what I should do and what I planned to do. So I just want to recommend that to you if you're not already doing that. When people talk about keeping a practice journal or whatever, uh, maybe consider rather than it being a reflection of what happened in the kind of way that we typically think about journals and think of it more as like a to-do list, a plan, because it's about intentionality. If I Take a minute or two to sit down and go, this day, these are the things that I want to do. And then when it comes time to practice, I can check in and just do those things. I have, you know, already kind of answered a lot of questions like, what are my goals? I'm re reminded of what my goals are. What can I do to accomplish those goals? Uh, split that out into individual exercises or things or whatever, you know, continuations of things you might already be working on. Um, but just that, that small amount of time where you've thought ahead to what you wanted to do is critical. It's critical. Um, so I would recommend giving that a shot. You don't have to buy a journal and do all that crap. You could just get a post-it note and just go, what am I doing today? You know, whatever. Give it a shot. But I think you'll find, as I have, that it's your practices go so much better. You're so much more productive and you feel at the end of the practice like, you know, very accomplished. Uh, and that's good. So consider that. All right. So let's talk let me play this blues head i wrote um this was for the second of three modules for this jazz blues accelerator course that i've been going through on uh, learn jazz standards um and this one the idea was to kind of combine the idea was to play uh to outline the changes so rather than just doing like bluesy stuff uh, that's good but also thinking about how to outline the chord changes um, and then personally my approach to this one was I wanted to create some sort of rhythm motif like uh, come up with some sort of rhythm and then repeat it and have it kind of uh, permeate the whole thing so that it sounds less like I just wrote down a solo and more like I actually composed a head you know something that is unique and and thought out so Let's see if I can remember it. <laughs> Goes something like this. like that i think that's that's pretty cool i didn't play it the same way both both times but that's the gist um so just doing this kind of um like these kind of three little two two note things and then there's a bluesy lick uh and then this i kind of stole from my limited exposure to miles's solo on olio uh where he kind of plays a minor um, like a a minor chord over a dominant, you know, like a minor arpeggio over a dominant chord to get the nine in there. Anyway, uh, something like that. So I'm playing like an F minor arpeggio, and I guess that's actually over, that's from the fifth. So that's playing five, seven, nine. Uh, 
chromatic stuff, beboppy stuff in there. And then that, uh, that repeated rhythmic thing, followed by some sort of lick. That's kind of taken from 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 Miles as well. Um, let's see, what does he do? It's sort of an enclosure dancing around it. And then I just straight up play an arpeggio over the G um, with it with an arc enclosure at the start, so and then you got this nice little half step jump there to the third of the C minor. that rhythm again and then a lick and that's also stolen from that miles thing or at least inspired by it so that's cool i'm you know reasonably proud of that because <laughs> i feel like it uh it sounds like a hit like a blues head and i was able to take a lot of things that i've been working on and throw them in there you know take I only worked out like a very small amount of this oleo solo, but I was able to learn a lot from it, you know, and take it and put it into a thing. And I think that's kind of what this course is really getting at, right? One of the things. One of them is working your ears. So as we go through the weeks and we keep changing keys, uh, transposing, learning things by ear and transposing them to other keys is getting easier and easier. Like it's quicker and quicker for me to get through these things, not because I'm rushing, just because it comes faster. Uh, and then getting to where you're regularly writing your own material as a way to take things that you've been noodling around on or learning from transcriptions or practicing and putting them in a musical context. So I think learning a solo by ear is great for your ears, certainly great to be able to play some amount of information, but then you need to find bits of it that you like and work it into a little, he calls them an A2 to study, right? Uh, or something, you know, write out a solo. I've talked about this a little bit before, but writing your own solos gives you that, uh, an excuse to take all this stuff that's kind of fresh on your mind and put it into practice in a real jazz scenario. And that's just piling on more and more practice, right? The more times, the more different angles you attack the same material, the better it's going to lodge itself into your subconscious. And then when it comes time on the bandstand to play for real, you just pull this stuff out of nowhere, right? Seemingly from nowhere. Okay, that is enough chit-chatting from me, I think. Um, starting module three, the final one, I've been more learning um, um, straight note chaser, that's an E. The original is in B flat. I think I thought I'd uh, finish up with a playing straight note chaser a couple uh choruses a few choruses maybe and then call it a video so uh here we go <laughs> Thank you. 
watching guys i will see you next time